Mm -hmm. um, so if you don't identify as a Democrat, what do you identify as? Um, oof, that's a good question. Um, I don't think that there's a good single identifier. I mean, there are a lot of labels and you and I can have a million conversations about yeah. what I do and do not like about labels or majority <laughs> don't like about them. Yes. Um, but I'll say, um, and this is, um, before I go into this, because this is going to be kind of the crux, I think that this is a good point to start talking about why are we doing a podcast, <laughs> sure. yeah. um, which is that uh, you and I uh, are friends, first of all. I'm, I'm Warlock. This is Lil' King. Yeah. And yeah. we've been <laughs> friends. I'm just, I, I assume somebody's <laughs> going to listen to this and just in case. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, going to god listen. damn uh no but we've been friends since high school and i think very early on like we were in plays together and so there's a lot of like waiting for cues in the wings and then just like having hushed conversation and we're in kind of a serious uh mode because we're you know we want to do a good job there and also that play that we were in for the first time uh where we were like uh co like leadish people yeah um it was a political play. There was a lot to discuss. And there were a lot of um, observations or the presentation of observations in that play that were kind of, uh, some of them were good, some of them were poignant, but some of them were really weak. Some of them were very confused. There were a lot of issues. And so you and I kind of, some of our very first, um, as like good friends conversations, revolved around like analyzing things, being critical about um, art and politics and kind of a, a spectrum of things and um, eventually personal relationships and things like that. And uh, so the reason I would say that we're moving into this podcast is because for years we've been friends and we have these long ass, you know, sitting in the car with it running, I'm supposed to drop you <laughs> off. And then we're just sitting there talking for like four extra yeah, hours four as we hours analyze <laughs> every angle and every perspective and go through and have these um, very open, vulnerable, but critical conversations. And it, it's really sad because then you and I will go out and we'll, we'll have these conversations and we'll have these ideas and these, these questions bouncing around in our heads. And then we'll go out into the world. And, and I, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I know that I very often am just disappointed <laughs> at the cognitive willingness of people outside my home. Of people who, or even some of the people inside my home, <laughs> uh, but you know this this um, either inability or unwillingness to really delve into a subject, and and it's something that seems so important where it doesn't really matter if we're talking about something important like um, the presidential nominees for the upcoming election, or if we're talking about something simple like uh, controller versus keyboard and video <laughs> games. Uh, which was a recent conversation. Uh, the point is, is that we're analyzing things. We're willing to be wrong. We're presenting a conversation like an argument and working through it. Um, and and I think that that critical process is something that um, not enough people do. And I think a lot of people don't do it. Uh, sometimes it's because of effort, but a lot of it is is just due to like they don't have the structures for it. They haven't been presented like the template for how do we do this. Most people say like, "Here's my opinion." If anybody says anything to like question it, it's seen as an attack. And yeah. I would really like, yeah, if there's any goal here for the podcast is one, I would like to be entertaining, but also I, I want people to understand that there's a way that we can talk about things and analyze and question. Um, even within you know a friend group, even with very vulnerable topics, have these conversations that um, leave us all bettered, leave us all more understanding. Yeah, yeah, I'm disappointed by the people of this world every single day, and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, absolutely, I think that I spend a lot of my time, yeah, speaking with you, uh, reading those kinds of things, just trying to engage in activities that, yeah, I can learn something, and yeah, I can feel a little better afterward, and maybe even impart some betterment onto others and yeah with in terms of critical discussion uh i think that's a, a great way to do that i think that argumentation is uh, the greatest form of, of communication and it also brings people closer together and um, when emotions do get uh involved 
that can be a problem. It can also be a good thing. Like you said, having a vulnerable conversation can be really important to it being a, a genuine one. So it's one of the few places where I feel like emotions kind of belong because I think there's a lot of places where they don't <laughs> like politics mm -hmm. uh, and or classrooms or most of the public space. I, you know, your emotions should be put away because you don't need them. They aren't going to help you. Nobody cares about how you feel. <laughs> And yeah, I think uh, having these conversations, yeah, where we're able to get emotional, but not in a, in a toxic way, not in a way that dominates or um, undermines the other person saying no one's getting, you know, gaslit or anything like that, where we're able to, mm. yeah, really be honest with each other and, and be ourselves, but also, like you said, learn from each other and, and all that. So yeah, I mm. think it's really important. Yeah. Both that we set an example of, of how this can be done in a healthy and mature way, and also to do it and, and have people enjoy us doing it. Right. And, and and if we want to talk about like we like a record of like, hey, is this sustainable? Hey, does this work? I can say we've actually lived together, we <laughs> shared an apartment for a year. And like that doesn't mean that we were like great the whole time, but we were able to talk about it. And we had two other roommates there that we had almost no ability to speak to about any yeah. issue. So like they like we couldn't get them to do dishes or we couldn't do anything. And like any little issue that came up between just me and Lil King, we were able to solve pretty easily. And I want to bring you back to a conversation. I don't know if you've thought about this since I think about it almost daily, okay. <laughs> which is the microwave. <laughs> how you would always leave time. You would never stop the microwave. You would pause the microwave. Yeah. yeah I, I assume <laughs> you still do this to your family. <laughs> so I I gained something from that. And also I er, I learned to hate something about that <laughs> that I previously had no opinion about. So what I, do you want to explain what you what you did, or should I explain? It? I I mean I, I think you've explained it already, but yeah, I mean you you put your food into the microwave, you set a time, the microwave takes down as it heats up your food, and then normal people wait for the microwave to finish ticking, it dings, and they take their food out. I, being an abnormal person, I get a feeling of when my food is hot enough, and then I pull it out as soon as I feel that. regardless of the time remaining. All right. You you missed a very important element. Okay. All right. What did I miss? Not only do you just feel when it's ready and not really care about how much time is on there, but you also refuse to use the number buttons. Yeah. It's very important, right, that I – right, I always quick start. I always do – if there's like a minute or 30-second plus button, I just hit that a number of times because it doesn't matter. Yeah. I'm going to pull out early anyway. Right, right. So, so here's something I've taken away, something I've gained is, since having that experience of, of dealing with walking into the kitchen every single day and it says like 14 seconds remaining when I need to know if I'm late to leave to work or something. <laughs> uh, one thing I've gained is that I know that if I'm ever uh, making something in the microwave that takes less then or it takes two minutes and 30 seconds or less i should just hit the plus 30 seconds i'm saving myself clicks that's yeah. one thing i've see, learned see? Yeah. until you hit three minutes you can just hit the add 30 seconds the other thing is i didn't really care if somebody you know left the microwave there until it became the only clock because we didn't have one on the stove um and uh generally i'd have like my phone in my laptop bag um, and so it was like annoying to get to. Yeah. And we were idiots and didn't just hang up a clock. Yeah. Yeah. We never hung up a clock. That was, we knew the whole, the whole time. That was a very <laughs> temporary situation. Yeah. We barely decorated. <laughs> we didn't try. We knew those two were going to flake out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I learned a burning hatred for people who do not open it. And then also hit the off button. And I didn't realize yeah. it's something that I had always done until I met someone who didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I do sometimes hit the off button. Sometimes I don't. I, that's actually worse to me. <laughs> that's <laughs> actually more offensive. <laughs> My favorite thing is to pull it out at one second. Just because I want to beat the ding. Right. Well, I mean, I that's that something too. you do. You and I both have um, what some people would call a terribly unhealthy sleep schedule i just yep. wouldn't call it a sleep schedule mm 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> what we do is we're up at like super, super late in, in the day all the time, but we have people in our houses that have like a schedule and are not right. doing that generally. So you got to beat the day. So, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like, um, it feels like diffusing a bomb at like one <laughs> second. Like, I've, you, you you stop it and you're like, yes, you, uh, another night of safe slumber <laughs> 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 for the civilians, you know? <laughs> oh, God. And then you miss it. And then it's like now all of, of Gondor knows you're here, whatever it was. What's that? Yeah, mean? Yeah. All of China knows you're here. <laughs> Mulan, not Lord of the Rings. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah. Wow. We have a lot to say about microwaves. We do. Yeah, yeah, I think there's more, but we can move on if we want to. Uh, no, no, no. We can keep talking about my. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we've exhausted all of the microwave conversation. Again, I'm not convinced, but I'm willing to move on. Oh, go ahead. All right, what's the next point? Bring it okay. up. Okay, well, uh, I have a question. Uh, do you use a microwave cover, or do you regularly clean your microwave? I regularly clean my microwave. Okay, see, I use a microwave cover, and then I regularly clean the cover, and then the microwave yeah. just stays clean. Yeah. Well, so part of it is you got to think you have three reasonable adults mm. and two microwaves. I have me. <laughs> I'm barely a reasonable adult. Two <laughs> other barely reasonable adults and then three obnoxious children. Yeah, yeah. So even if we had a cover, it's it not would, getting yeah, used. It would, you it know would, what? Would. Actually, so to as an example of, of how confident I am in that fact, we have a Keurig machine. Yeah. And for some reason, my sisters, who are between the ages of, like, 12 and 14, um, they really like coffee. They've been getting into coffee a lot. I think it's because my dad doesn't really keep pop in the house or soda. Yeah. And so uh, their their addiction to caffeine gets kind of, like, cut off. And so yeah, they, need, they need something. And so they're going for coffee. I don't think they actually care. Based on how much creamer they're using, they're actually getting very little coffee. Um, but... They also have like those little metal water bottles that, you know, they're supposed to take to school and stuff. So they'll fill those up with coffee and they have to pull out because it doesn't fit. They can't wedge it in to the Keurig machine. Yeah. They have to pull out that bottom little like trap that catches all of the drippy coffee at the end. Yeah. And not once has a single one of them remembered to put it back. (laughs) Ever. Well, if they put it back, they're going to pull it out again. It's so inconvenient. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, well, the annoying thing for me is that they don't even put it in the same spot when they take it off. So, like, the cure <laughs> is on top of our house. microwave. Yeah, sometimes it's on the counter, sometimes it's on the stove, sometimes it's on the kitchen table. I didn't find it this morning. And so sometimes this happens where I just have to do, like, long-distance skill-based coffee pouring. <laughs> 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 or hold it the whole time, which is also yeah. not great. Oh, uh, yeah, th- th- so to have like a, a microwave cover or something like that, they would never remember to use it ever, yeah. and then that would get dirty, and then we would never clean it. Probably, right? Yeah, you should have thrown it out. Just go, yeah, it's fine. To start over, <laughs> burn the house down, and just I did when I first moved again. in. I had a mini fridge and a personal microwave, and I have since lost those conveniences, and it hits hard, especially Wait, with the coffee creamer. Why did you lose them? Uh, the uh, mini fridge stopped working. Oof, and then the microwave. There wasn't really a good place to put it anywhere because it was resting on top of the mini fridge, which I had to throw out. Um, and then maybe for a short while, we used it as the main microwave because like our other one broke. And then now it's just in the basement, and it might be set up for Nina, my uh, one of my little sisters. My mini fridge yeah. still works, so nice. Yeah, I want the mini fridge. Race. I I don't know what broke it. It was at the end of when we were at that apartment. It first stopped working. Oh, I do remember that. And then yeah, I yeah. got it working again. Like I thawed it out and cleaned it out, and I got it working again. And then it worked for another like four or five months, and then it stopped working. And then when I threw it out, I found a bug had like crawled and like dug a hole through oh. like where one of the back wires connects into it. So there was actually like a hole in the back of the fridge. So I feel like that could have been part of it, but. I, I don't know. And it was like a bug I'd never seen before. I swear. It, it could have been like a little baby alien or some shit. It was a yeah, weird prob- It probably was a baby alien, then, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's more likely than just some bug I hadn't seen before. Yeah, right. Uh, I, on the topic of kitchen etiquette and Keurig machines at my Absolutely. place of work. Yeah, of course. It's a general topic we discuss most days. Um, at my place of work, uh, no one, aside from myself, will remove their K-cup from the Keurig 
after getting coffee. Okay, so that's something I deal with here. And at first, I was a little bit upset about it. But I've, I've actually developed a, 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 an understanding for why that would happen. Um, which is that when you first make a cup of coffee, like, obviously those things don't drain right away. And it's just yeah, sure, coffee sure. grounds. Whole, so those things are, like, really, really hot. Uh, right. I would say in a workplace when you're making back to back to back cups of coffee, it's probably worse because then, sure, it's hot for you, but somebody's about to come in two seconds from now. It hasn't cooled down, and now they have to deal with yeah. Shit, so I guess yeah, that's I mean, right. I end up because I also don't always do coffee. I'll do like tea and stuff. Like I'll do things that don't need a cup. I just need to run water through it. And so I'm just like, I mm. could have gotten through this process without even using a cup, without throwing away a cup or touching a cup. Yeah, without having coffee grounds drip on me because again. I'm not even drinking coffee here, but then I had to anyway. Yeah. But sometimes I'll just walk up to it and pull out whatever cup is in there because I know there's one in there. (laughs) It is interesting that you and I being so against microtransaction and kind of unnecessary monetization in games are like both on board with Keurig, (laughs) which is just... they did too good of a job. Yeah. They said, we can make a crappy cup of coffee, but so much more convenient that no one will be willing to yep. make themselves regular better coffee or French press or anything else. Yeah. It's, it's too convenient. Yeah. No, they, yeah. It's a great business model. You really got to hand it to them. Whoever it was who was like, Hey, I, I, I know that we make coffee, but I've been playing this mobile game and I think they're on to something. <laughs> Speaking of, 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 uh, monetization. Yeah. Um, and, and, and specifically game dev, this is something that I was, um, I might have mentioned to you um, where I, I'm following very closely the development of Diablo 4 because I have some concerns with Blizzard and I also really like the Diablo games and so I want something um, good to come of their development. And since they're being so open about what they're doing, I've been trying to stay as informed as is possible. Yeah. Um, and so recently they uh, it was revealed that they were hiring a monetization expert for Diablo and like the job description said that somebody who could not only, you know, think outside the box and box and come up with interesting ways of of doing this, but also that will share their findings with the rest of the Blizzard team outside of Diablo 4. Right. And and I thought it was interesting because uh, it, it obviously had some implications about the state of the game and how far they are in development, but I thought it was very interesting um uh bringing them in at this time because I've always kind of looked at monetization as like one of two camps. One camp being the mostly that mobile game kind of a camp where all of the game elements, all of the mechanics, all of the features and systems are really just ways to funnel you into their pay to win or whatever their payment system. You know, like there are plenty of games where the whole thing is like, we're going to tease you. We're going to say you get this little bit. We're going to give you the promise of gameplay, but you have to go through multiple payments to get there, really, um, or to sustain it. Um, it, it is yeah. something we see really popular. And then the other thing I see, uh, or that I've, I've imagined, is that people make a game, and at the end they go, how much did we spend? Let's come up with a box price. And then, oh, people are still playing this and still want support. Uh, how do we pay for that? Oh, well, let's make this, and let's make loot boxes or skins or something and add them in um afterwards uh which is a very naive way of looking at how that works but um it just it it kind of brings up some interesting questions about like at what point in game dev do you add in the monetization element at what point is it appropriate to do so or ethical to do so and and um yeah, I think that there are a lot of conversations. Is that something that you've thought about? About like when during creating the game you would think about making money off of it? Uh, definitely thinking about it in terms of, right, like you said, the the more naive approach, but it's also the more natural approach of we're going to spend something on this and then we're going to want to make our money back and then make some money after that. And then that's that's our plan. And it, it is. It is it is a rather naive approach. It certainly isn't the business-oriented way of doing things because – you know, business has had such a negative connotation in terms of, you know, our usual liberal, <laughs> fiscally liberal uh, conversation. But of course, business is a good thing. You know, it pays people. It gives people work. So, we, you know, we like business. 
And when we're talking about the business model of the microtransactions, the mobile game setup, um, like you said, they say, how do we get people to want to pay for this? And part of that is developing systems that will cause, that will create addictions and dependencies almost, you know, to, to come back to the game in order to succeed at it, as well as to spend money in order to succeed at it. And you get people who are getting this compelling and financial <laughs> enjoyment, you know, this costly enjoyment out of a thing. And in terms of, so then you said ethical and that's a complicated question because is it yeah is it ethical to essentially be tricking people into paying you money for something that you know doesn't the things they're paying for aren't what cost you money it's you know it's confusing but also you know if they're getting an enjoyment then it's good but if you're causing an addiction then it's bad like cigarettes are not you know what something i would think of as ethical mm -hmm. and and yet you know there are other 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 products that can be purchased that give people enjoyment that can build up addiction like caffeine coffee that we were just talking about that we don't think of as unethical but it's not mm. really different and I, I would think of this as kind of a similar thing of with the microtransaction and mobile gaming structure of yeah tr let's try to get you hooked on this game and then you can then you can start paying us on a regular basis it doesn't feel particularly ethical to me and then it doesn't feel particularly unethical it's certainly i mean if people are enjoying it you know, can we can we say that they're wrong? Right. It's hard to say. Well, I mean, I know that I'm looking at it less of like the cigarette addiction route, but more of like we, we live in Ohio where up until uh, a couple of years ago, we weren't allowed to have casinos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And gambling and is a big so, part of it with, with pack opening and loot box opening, et cetera. Yeah. Gambling is absolutely part of it. Yeah. And and so looking at it from that angle, you know, we as a as a whole state decided until recently that we don't want casinos and we want uh, certain regulations. And at no point during the time, which was, you know, most of my childhood, that we didn't have casinos and gambling available. Were there like game stores where people would go play blackjack for fun? No money involved. Right. 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 There, so we see that the actual like systems and mechanics are are very weak. Those things are not compelling. And so I guess my stance would be that it, any game that cannot stand on its own without the monetization system, I mean, immediately, it, it's not good. Yeah, it's a red flag for sure. But further over, it, it, it is, I, I would say, at its core, predatory. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, because exactly. The games that say, hey, you want to play our game? You're enjoying it? Awesome. You, you you can keep playing and you're like sweet it doesn't cost money i mean i can't spend money but it doesn't cost money and then the game starts to just hit you with wave after wave of things you can't do because you don't have money making the levels harder and harder to the point where difficulty is not a tool to challenge the players but the difficulty actually reaches nigh impossible unless you're spending money it's no mm -hmm. longer something that is a mechanical or mental challenge for the player which essentially i would say is one of the you know main bases of gaming is challenge yourself it's removing that by being too challenging to the point where a human can't do it and you have to buy the power up upgrade etc to be able to have an ability to do it and then at that point yeah predatory is a great word for that hmm. especially for players who are ignorant that that is the system and they are being tricked they're being told that they're not playing well enough and they're thinking well there's pro gamers out there there are humans that could do this i'm just not good enough but that's okay five bucks i'll get the boost and i'll catch up i'll get to the next threshold i'll be able to play a little more before i have to spend again that's a lie you 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 couldn't have gotten through that without the five dollars and now you spent five dollars for some reason <laughs> hard mm. to trace back why you had to do that so if you were making your own game imagine for a moment you know whatever it is you're making a game at what point do you think you start looking at microtransactions and and to what degree do you think you can push that like how far do you think you can go without it becoming predatory or unethical or um I don't know. How do you think it goes? Yeah, too that's, far? A, that's, a, that's that's a, that's a really hard question. I, I think going back, harkening back to your previous question of when in game dev would I would I consider my, uh, uh, not microtransactions but any monetization? I would say to that question, I would say I would try to I would want to do it entrepreneurially as soon as possible. I would I, from that mindset, I would I would think that as soon as I can start considering how this game is making money, 
that's really important. So like I said, you know, are we, yeah, are we selling, are we have a sticker price or are we doing microtransactions, et cetera. I would want to get that down as soon as I can. But also, as you pointed out, you know, you have games where they do a sticker price and then they make expansions or they, yeah, they add some DLCs, they add some more things that maybe they didn't even intend. Maybe they did intend. Maybe it was some stuff that was left over from the, the game being made and they just threw it in after for five bucks. Um, maybe they threw it in for free. So with microtransaction, microtransactions specifically, I think that I'm not sure that's a really hard one because I, I want to say I would try to avoid them. I would want people to pay up front and and then I, you know, and then I get the money and then I can make more game and then get money and make more game. I like that model because it, it feels more straightforward. It feels like, yeah, I'm not on any ethical lines or anything like that. But I also think the microtransactions are something that a lot of players maybe don't enjoy but they they partake in willingly it's they're not being uh tricked into so you know i don't want to lose those players <laughs> i don't want those players to find my game uh, rather uninspiring so it's, it's difficult to say that i would not do microtransactions whatsoever but i would certainly want to avoid them because of everything we've said because they don't particularly feel ethical they don't really feel right to me and and all the the games that I've seen that have really struggled to keep them up, where they have microtransactions that they keep changing the price of because they don't know what they're supposed to charge people, and people don't know what they're supposed to be being charged because these aren't actually products that we're buying. So the price is super fluid, and that's confusing. It's confusing for the businesses, bottom line. It's confusing for the players. I find in games with microtransactions, I spend a lot of time waiting for sales on those microtransactions, and I end up not buying any. I'm like, I'll buy them when they change the price arbitrarily lower and then uh, then I'll maybe afford them and then they don't or they do and I then at that point I don't care anymore yeah I, I think that um with microtransactions um the longer someone is exposed to them the more likely they are to become disinterested in them yeah I guess like yeah. uh I think that yeah if you boot up a game for the first time for example let's say Hearthstone we play Hearthstone for the first time we are playing for a day and we're like, wow, this game's crazy. I want to play this game. And then they're like, hey, here's this uh, pre-order thing or here's, you know, whatever, the, the starter bundle, five bucks. You can get, you know, a whole bunch of packs, get yourself a little, you know, boost as you're getting started. Day one. Yeah, that sounds great. But later on, uh, you know, you've been playing for a couple of months. You realize the pace that you're earning stuff and the value of things. And you go, eh, that, that doesn't really make sense. Right. Or you understand better the randomness of the system. I feel like uh, participating or not, the longer you are exposed to any microtransaction system, the easier it is to say, I don't give a shit about interesting. Right. And I think the irony of that, and you may, I think you make a great point. I agree. Um, I, I think the irony of that is that as a, as a, as a salesman of microtransactions, you'd really be crossing your fingers for the opposite thing to be going on, that you get loyal players that then eventually begin to invest in your game. Right. It well, just that, doesn't that happen would be like that. Kind of the the what you would want. That would be the ethical version, right? Right. Is exactly. The presentation of these things is is hey, you like the game, you want more content, you know we're making content, you know we have limited resources. Here's where you can be rewarded for a. It's a free right. service. It's not yeah. difficult for us to give you this thing, um, and you can get it if you support us. Right. You know, the, and, yeah. and that's like right along the lines of you know, and um, NPR does its. <laughs> <laughs> uh, drive saying, "Hey, we need donations." Yeah, to because that, that's absolutely that the, the way sense. that you sell the product. Right, that's how you package it. You, right. you you corral players for free or for cheap with your initial sticker price, and you give them a good product, and then you mm -hmm. essentially say, "Hey, if you would like to support us, make a donation." Right. And then it might be a kickback. Yeah, some sort of power level thing, some sort of aesthetic thing. But it, it really, it's it's give me a donation. It's very similar, actually, to the streaming platform of, hey, if you like me, go ahead and sub. You know, go ahead, you know, and you get some emotes. It's similar to that. And and yeah, like you said, I think that in terms of gaming, in terms of what we get out of gaming, and the yeah, the kind of inspirations and excitement of a new game, that's when we're most likely to spend. And that's again why I kind of default to maybe we just stick a price. Maybe we just give them a quick demo, some beta testing, and then we charge them when they're most mm -hmm. excited. And then if it's not a bad product, they get their money's worth. It's also a lot easier for me to justify, yeah, spending say $30 on a game and then, you know, kind of calculating in my head, like how much, how many hours do I need to spend on this game before I feel like I've gotten my money's worth? You know, is $3 an hour 
good. Yeah. So you, you know, you kind of get that ratio and you figure out what's okay. And, and then you do it. And, and then you feel you got your money's worth. And with games with microtransactions that are going to keep asking you to pay or offering you deals and that kind of stuff, um, putting up walls that you need to pay through. Yeah. Suddenly it, it becomes much harder to feel like you're getting your money's worth when you're no longer thinking, Oh, I spend 30 bucks. I play for this many hours. You're thinking I play for this many hours. Then I'll have to spend this much. And then I play for this. It, it's the same thing. It doesn't feel the same. It feels a lot worse. Right. I guess to that end, yeah, what do we think about paying for expansions, DLCs? So not quite yeah. the micro thing, but... but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's weird. Payments. For me, the way that I feel about it, and this is never going to line up with the way that businesses, you know, go about their businesses. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I really think that when I'm paying for a game, I want to pay for cost and profit on the development of the things that I got. I don't want to pay for cost and profit on things that I haven't gotten yet. Yeah. And even more egregious on stuff that I will have to pay for in the future. So yeah. for example, Destiny actually would be a good one. Destiny, Destiny 2. Um, when you buy the box game, they've already created the first handful of expansions. Yeah. Uh, they are done even if they're not releasing for another year they are completely done products they take the game in its entirety and then chop out little segments of it and parse those away um and so they're making you pay for the game and pay for the dlc even though they made it all together that i think is is a really egregious kind of a thing to do double dipping in a way and and the the thing that sucks is that there's no way to know when that happens. There's no way to know when that's intentional other than being, you know, in the development room, being, you know, there with the uh, publishers when these conversations are taking place. It's very difficult to know that. And again, we come back to the arbitrary pricing of things of like, well, how much does your game cost? Can I just pay that? And they're like, mm -hmm. no, <laughs> you can pay this much now, this much later. Yeah, it feels very scammy. Right. The, well, I would say that some things I have been enjoying in the development of these kind of alternative payment systems and microtransactions and things is uh, World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft has been the only major game that I think that's gotten away with a subscription-based platform. Only one I can think of, yeah. Yeah, and, and they've done very well, which is kind of interesting that in gaming it's so unpopular, whereas everywhere else, uh, you know, Disney Plus and the DC Magazines and, and Hulu and Netflix and all those are all yeah. um, getting into it now. It's like some big craze, but that's I guess that's different. That's everybody trying to recreate cable. Yes, but right, exactly. But the idea of monthly bills is is exactly right. Recreating cable, recreating our water bill, whatever. Yeah, we, we pay for things monthly. It's just a very normal thing to do in our, in our Western society. So. Right. Well, gaming's weird. Gaming, I mean, there could be a lot of reasons. The kind of, you know, when you pay for a game, you're not paying for, like, you know, if I subscribe to World of Warcraft, I don't get, like, every single Blizzard game. I just get this one thing. Right. Um, and so it's very limited, but the prices are still similar. Whereas, you know, if you pay for Hulu or Netflix, you're getting, you know, tons and tons of content. But, and but that end, Yeah, if, if Blizzard did say, get, you know, all players get booted out of their games, $10 a month, and you can have access to all the games, like... Would we pay that? Probably. But the interesting thing about it is that so World of Warcraft has gotten away with this $15 a month since 2004. Yeah. And it's never been an issue. I guess games are going towards, uh, with the whole Battle Pass craze thing going on. Yeah. I guess I wasn't, I wasn't thinking of that originally, but that is kind of the subscription, and I'm seeing a lot of games converting to Battle Pass. Yeah. Well, it's I've... not even just that that's a subscription. It's, it's that everybody's converting to, be it Battle Pass or whatever, some sort of an optional subscription system. And yeah, again, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I'm looking at Warcraft, because they don't use the trigger yeah, yeah, Battle Pass. Right. They say that if you play our game enough, we're going to reward you with not having to pay for it. But the idea being that if you're making insane amounts of money and you don't want to pay for the game or, you know, you're active in the community, you're making, you know, especially an online game work where there needs to be other people to interact with. And, and you know, you're almost on a level providing a service, uh, fulfilling a mechanic for the company that makes sense that they would uh, reward you. So I'm not saying that they're doing that system oh, yeah. perfectly, but I'm saying that. It makes sense that, yeah, if you have, um, I mean, because there are a lot of different battle pass options, some of them 
by completing the battle pass, which, you know, you don't have to buy, you know, there's the free version and then the, the paid version. Um, most of them have it set up so that if you complete the free version, you get enough money to buy the premium one. Yeah. And, and that makes sense. And if you get the premium one, you have enough to buy two of it or whatever these microtransaction options are. And I feel like that's an important element. I think when you get to monetization, I think that um, there is a big difference when we're having this conversation about what is predatory and what is unethical. I think that there's a layer of understanding that um, playing your game, spending your time doing that thing, engaging in anything, whatever media it is you're consuming, spending time doing that matters. So even if you're not directly even if it's a free game and that person is not engaging in the microtransactions and you're not making any direct profit off of them they're still talking yeah, about it they're still, engaging oh, yeah. it they're still spending time right they're still they're talking about it. yeah they're seeing other players in the world yeah no if you give me a game this is a subscription and i pay your 15 bucks and i walk in and there's no one there i'm not renewing my subscription and i'm not playing enough to renew my subscription i'm just leaving your game and yeah. so right even the players that are there for free matter because exactly like you said word of mouth and twitter and twitch and all of the different things as well as just the in the game the social in the game is important the time we spend doing things be they entertainment be they educational or whatever it matters it matters yeah both to the salesman and us to our educa education as mm -hmm. well as our enjoyment well i mean and i can think of a way where you know, imagine like uh, fall guys is all the craze right now right that system, I, I can think of a version of that game where it is still profitable, where there are no microtransactions, and they fully remove the box cost, right? Or not box cost, but the Steam cost, you know? So it's yeah. $20 plus microtransactions. You can remove both of those elements, right? You have your battle pass, and to complete it, you get, even if you get last place in the first round of that game, you still get like 50 experience or something. Yeah. So you're still leveling up. So the worst player in the world is still eventually going to hit max level in that battle pass. Even looking at that, if you remove the $20, you remove the microtransactions, people want to play it because it's fun. And people want to keep playing it because there's a progression system and there's ways that they can differentiate themselves from others and stand out and customize, right? It's got the elements of what is fun without any money spent. Yeah. And if they ship that, they still have all of the marketing of you own all of those things. If somebody wants to advertise and do a cereal or a shoe or a, a joint campaign, um, they have to get the rights to use your stuff. Yeah. And you could, they could be exceptionally profitable just by doing higher level business to business marketing stuff. They yeah, don't need totally to make that. their profit off of the individuals playing it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, advertising is a big thing. And we also see that in mobile gaming. And it's, of course, a big point of contention, right? You know, is this going to be a um, convince me to watch an ad game? Or is this going to be a microtransaction game? That's constantly what you're thinking whenever you download right. a mobile game is which which one of these is this going to be? Right. Or, I mean, you also have the entire aspect of esports. There are ways that yeah. you can get revenues yes. from people playing it without getting it yep. from the people playing it. Yeah, once we make it to esports, that's typically where we see the endorsements come in with the jerseys, with the, you know, Progressive or whatever, sponsoring Team Liquid or whatever's going on. We finally start to see that. But yeah, the fact that it's not at the lower level, right? The more like NASCAR cars and your fall guys right but but uh, you know what i'm saying is that there is a way that if you have enough players if you make a good enough product and you release it for free and have no way of somebody giving you money for it you can avoid any of those ethical concerns and still be extremely profitable absolutely yeah, and then you can run ad, you know, and the ads don't have to be ads they can be like right. you said sponsorships they can be yeah right. and i understand that that's like a um less uh, steady, a less secure uh, business model and that there are reasons why people wouldn't want to go for it. But the point is, is that it is viable and it is at least consistent enough that we know that it's, it's viable. Right. And like, think if Genji's booty just said Geico on it this entire time. Anytime a Genji double jumped over your head, you just saw Geico and you're just like, oh yeah. I was thinking less of the route of putting ads into the game, which is a direct profit off of the player base. Um, it, it still is a direct profit off of the player race, but, um, rather than that, but like saying, you know, Geico, Geico wants to make a new commercial and they have standing next to the little lizard gecko guy, they have a fall guy 
And the fall guy grabs him and he's like, oh, hey, 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 oh, hey, get your hands off of me. You know, like that could be an advertisement and, and Geico would pay money to be able to use that and capitalize on that, on the, the pop culture fever. That's what I'm saying, where there is a viable pathway without involving your player base, just having the player base exist and then using those marketing elements. Yeah, no, you're right. Say, okay. I was um, thinking like NASCAR yeah. cars, but yeah, your thing makes right. sense. Well, I mean, just think about like every laptop, every gaming laptop you've seen advertised. There's always, always Warframe and Fortnite and all yeah, of these games sure. that we never get the laptop ad in Fortnite, but uh, Fortnite right. is marketing its very unique style and name. You know, and, and them profiting. So say Fall Guys does the $20 fee and microtransactions to the full extent and a paid battle pass and a subscription. Like say they did every yeah. single thing. None of those preclude them from being able yeah. to continue and go make the Geico commercial. Right. I would say uh, what Angry Birds? The first, Angry Birds is a good example mind. of getting yeah. every single level of microtransaction. Yep. Pretty yeah, much. right. They, they, well, yeah, because they, they ask us for what, a dollar to play? And then... Yeah, I think yeah. There's some. There might be some microtransactions in app. They're not really relevant. You can just play the game. I think it's but a dollar then, to play, and then you have to buy the rest of the levels, which get more expensive. No, I think you can just play. unlock them. I think you can progress. I think it's like uh, any of these grindy games. I think you can grind through and unlock them. I, I believe so. Um, but then, yeah. Then additionally, right? Yeah, we've seen Angry Birds on commercials. There's an Angry Birds cartoon. There's like two Angry Birds movies. Mm -hmm. um, there's Angry Birds plushies. Yeah, they they recognize that what right what they made was not just a video game. I think that there's more we need to talk about with with game stuff more than just uh, microtransactions, but I feel like sure. we've covered a good amount yeah. of topics. This might be a good enough amount of stuff to digest. Is there anything you want to say to folks? We probably need a closing song or something, right? We'll we'll, we'll write you write up the music, I'll write up the lyrics, and then we'll just we'll sing okay. it together next time. I was just thinking you improv a song right now for us, but honestly, <laughs> I. I'm, I'm not going to lie. What came to mind when you said improv a song was not improv. It was SpongeBob's indoors song. <laughs> immediately popped into my head. Just Interesting. Indoors, indoors, <laughs> indoors. So that's, that's what I've got for you. Wow. Good night, everybody. Blessed. Uh, all right, yeah, everybody, join us next time <laughs> where we will maybe talk about things like infinite games, live game evolution, probably something to do with Dungeons and Dragons, and more specifically, Mimic Cuties <laughs> will be a topic of discussion. I don't know what most of those things are. That's fine. Uh, yeah, that's the whole thing. Uh, we'll see you. Jesus. Whenever, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Wear a mask. Don't be a jerk. It's another SpongeBob song. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Don't be a jerk. That's a good one, too. That's a yeah. fucking banger. <laughs> <laughs> it's right up there with Gary. Come home. <laughs>